Hello, my name is Jake. I'm a mathematician from Chicago. This video is a study guide for abstract algebra. It's meant for people who are new to the subject. So if you're taking your first course in abstract algebra, or if you're trying to teach yourself the material, this video is meant for you. So what I'm going to do is I've already written out this study guide. It's available on my website. And in this video, I'm going to read through it and maybe add a few details and give you a general sense about what sorts of things should come up in a first abstract algebra course. So if you want to follow along, the study guide's available on my website. You can go to herndonmathservices.com. And at least for now, the study guide's right on the front page. It's the Undergraduate Abstract Algebra Study Guide. If you click the, if you click the Google Doc, it will take you here. And I also want to mention that I tutor online. So if you're looking for a math tutor, uh, you can fill out the registration form here. It looks like this. Or you can just email me at jake at herndonmathservices.com and I'll get back to you with more information about my tutoring services. Okay, on to the study guide. Along the left, you can see all the major topics that I want to cover. Your specific course might cover a little bit more or a little bit less, but I, I think there's going to be a pretty good overlap with these topics. So let me begin. So it's a good idea to start by thinking about the integers. Uh, this is something that probably you already know something about. Uh, so the integers are just whole numbers, positives, negatives, and zero. And uh, I'm guessing you have lots of experience adding and multiplying integers together already. So because you already know a lot about these things, it can be kind of hard to see what else there is to learn. So I, I've written out four facts that by the end of your first course, you should hopefully be comfortable with. So first fact, the operation of addition makes the integers a group. Second fact, Every cyclic group is isomorphic to a quotient of the integers. Third fact, the operations of addition and multiplication make the integers a ring. And fourth fact, the ring of integers is a Euclidean domain, but not a field. So I'll just mention that facts one and three, they're basically just definitions. Once you know the vocabulary, there's really not much else going on there. Facts two and four, they're a little bit more than vocabulary. Those are going to take a little bit more thinking to, to fully understand. Okay, what do all these facts have in common? Uh, they're all about addition and multiplication. Abstract algebra is the study of operations, and because you already have lots of experience with the operations of addition and multiplication of integers, it makes it a good entry point into the subject. So you're also going to want some kind of background in set theory. You don't really need too much to do abstract algebra, but the most important concepts from a set theory are equivalence relations and functions. So your instructor is probably going to assume that you already know about these things. Uh, so here's a few questions to kind of test your knowledge. So question one. A relation between sets x and y is a subset of the Cartesian product x cross y. What does this mean? So specifically, you should be able to tell me what a subset is and what a Cartesian product is. If you can do that, that's all I'm asking. Question two, every function is a relation. How? What does that mean? Question three, Every function defines an equivalence relation on its domain. What is this equivalence relation? So none of, none of these are meant to be very deep. If you know how to answer these, then it should be pretty much straightforward how to do it. Uh, if you don't know, that's fine. But your instructor is probably going to assume you know what these things mean uh, pretty early on in the course. So try to wrap your head around these things soon. Uh, there's special kinds of functions that come up over and over again in abstract algebra. 
So you'll want to be familiar with injections, surjections, and bijections. And here is one of the most useful facts in all of existence. Any function can be decomposed into a surjection followed by a bijection followed by an injection in a, in a canonical way. So if you can explain what this means and why it's true, then the rest of abstract algebra is going to be a lot easier for you. Uh, and I put a link to an explanation of this fact. It's a proof wiki link. If you click on it, it'll bring you to this page for quotient theorem for sets. Down here, there's a diagram where you've got uh, a function along the top and then along the sides and the bottom you've got what a surjection a bijection and an injection i encourage you to look at this for as long as it takes to to see what's going on so the next thing i want to talk about is congruence and unique factorization um, so do you remember when you were a kid and you were doing long division um, also known as division with remainder, or sometimes people call it synthetic division. Uh, this comes up in an abstract algebra course. So it's good to be honest with yourself here. Do you really remember how to do long division, or uh, has that skill kind of gotten a little shaky over the years? So uh, I've put a link to the division theorem here. If you click on this, the theorem is stated right here. Commit it to memory. Make sure every part of it is correctly stored in your brain. Uh, so the theorem says, for every pair of integers a and b, where b is not equal to 0, there exist unique integers q and r such that this equation holds a equals qb plus r, and these inequalities hold. r is bigger than or equal to 0 and smaller than the absolute value of b. So this is coming up in an algebra class because right here in this equation, you've got multiplication and addition. And like I said, algebra is the study of operations. So this kind of uses it all. And on proof wiki, they also write the theorem out again symbolically here. Um, so just make sure you agree that this statement is the same as the one right above it, this statement here. And they also give a proof of the theorem here. Uh, if you don't know a proof by now, it's good to look one over. And back to the guide. Okay, well, here's an important uh, here's an important definition. Let n be any integer. We say two integers a and b are congruent mod n if a and b have the same remainder when divided by n. Make sure you can prove that this defines an equivalence relation on the integers. Uh, that part is set theory. The algebra kicks in here. So the relevant thing in an algebra class is that the set of equivalence classes has its own operations. What I mean is you can add and multiply the equivalence classes directly. So sometimes in algebra courses, you also study prime numbers. Um, this might include studying the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. That's the thing that says every natural number greater than one has a unique prime factorization. The proof of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic usually involves the division theorem. So don't forget about division remainder. It's going to come up a few times in your mathematical career. So don't sleep on it. All right, the first major topic when you're studying abstract algebra and where things really start to get good is uh, when you start to study group theory. So if this is your first time with, with the material, there's going to be a lot of vocabulary to learn. So here's the most important concepts, I think. You're going to want to know what a group is, what a subgroup is, what a normal subgroup is, and what a quotient group is. Uh, and then also what a homomorphism and what an isomorphism is. So if you don't already know those definitions, you can click on these links and it'll take you to the definition. So here's the definition for a group uh, somewhere in here. Here it is. 
Okay, um, but I'm not writing the definitions in my document because anywhere you look, they're the same. You can ask your instructor or check in your book or check any one of hundreds of websites and they'll all say the same thing. So what I do want to mention is uh, that memorization should be a normal part of your studies. So think about it like learning a new language. There's a whole language to talk about groups. And whenever you're learning a new language, start off learning a ton of vocabulary. Hopefully, after you've been using the vocabulary for after you've been using the vocabulary for a while, it's not so bad. Uh, it just kind of fades into the background, and you can actually say interesting things about that vocabulary. So, uh, studying math is a lot like learning a new language. Sometimes you should just kind of expect memorization to be part of it, for better or worse. Okay, uh, so groups, it's a huge topic. I've broken it up into a few subtopics. The first one is the isomorphism theorems. So the isomorphism theorems for groups, they use all of this vocabulary. If you're still struggling with this vocabulary, there's no way you're going to be able to understand what the theorems are saying. So I've posted a, or not posted, but I, I've linked the first isomorphism theorem for groups here. You can read the statement if you want to review it. And I've also asked a few questions about the theorem here just to kind of test your knowledge. So let's see how you do. Suppose G is a group. Question one, every normal subgroup of G can be used to define a homomorphism whose domain is G. How is this done? Question two, if F is a homomorphism with domain G, then there is a normal subgroup of G associated with F. What is this normal subgroup? So once you know what the first isomorphism theorem is saying, answering these questions should follow pretty much straight from the theorem. Uh, next, I want to talk about examples of groups. Uh, there's tons of examples. Learn as many as you can. Uh, particularly, permutation groups are super important. Uh, permutation groups are also sometimes called symmetry groups. And there's a theorem called Cayley's theorem that's usually covered in a first abstract algebra course that kind of tells you why permutation groups are so relevant in group theory. So Cayley's theorem says every group is isomorphic to a subgroup of a permutation group. So that's kind of like saying that if you want to understand groups, it's enough to understand subgroups and permutation groups, because every group is going to be a subgroup of a permutation group. So uh, that's sort of an oversimplification, because subgroups and permutation groups can get pretty complicated. Uh, but it's at least hopefully convincing you that this is an important theorem and that permutation groups show up all the time when you're studying group theory. So Cayley's theorem is usually covered in the first abstract algebra course, uh, but there's a corresponding fact about free groups that is sometimes not covered until a bit later. And I think this fact is great, and I'm going to share it with you now. I don't think it's going to cause any harm if you learn it early. So here's the fact. Every group is isomorphic to a quotient of a free group. And I've put a stack exchange link here that kind of explains this a bit more. You can click on that and see where it goes. Um, so I want to say a little bit more about how these two facts are kind of mirroring each other in a certain way. So I'm going to pull up the document cam here. Uh, so G is going to be a group, and then Haley says there exists a symmetry group, I'm going to call it S, uh, and an injective 
group homomorphism. F, that's the name of the homomorphism, and it goes from the original group into the symmetry group. So that is Kaylee. And then on the other side of this, this other fact about free groups. So even if you don't know what a free group is, hopefully you can see uh, the point I'm trying to make. So let me write out here. This other fact says when G is a group, there exists a free group. I'll call it F and a surjective group homomorphism. Starts with the free group and goes to the original group. So when you take these two facts together, the first one is kind of saying, Symmetry groups want to be codomains of group homomorphisms, and free groups want to be domains of group homomorphisms. Uh, or you could also say uh, this first fact is saying groups want to be subgroups of symmetry groups, and groups want to be quotients of free groups. So, uh, Second fact isn't always covered until a little bit later, but free groups are one of my favorite topics, so there you go. All right, back to the notes. Uh, we could talk about permutation groups and free groups until the end of time, so we should probably not do that. The next thing I want to cover is uh, the product group. So when G and H are groups, First of all, groups are sets, so you can do things like form the Cartesian product of the two sets, G and H. That's the set of all ordered pairs, where the first entry comes from G and the second entry comes from H. And this is relevant in abstract algebra because the set of pairs can be given its own group operation. So the, the most direct way to do this is using the group operation that's called the direct product. I've linked it here. So here's the formula for how the operation works. It's the only thing that you can always do. So you can see that G1 and G2, the coordinates in G, they just get multiplied together in the first coordinate. And H1 and H2, the coordinates in H, they just get multiplied together in the second coordinate. So I also want to mention that uh, depending on G and H, there might be lots of different operations on the product set that make it into a group, but this is the only one that's the direct product. There's also something called the semi-direct product, and there's something even more general than that, but uh, I think that's probably not going to be covered in your first course, so I'll leave that off for now. Other than the definition, there isn't much that a newcomer needs to know about the direct product, but if you are planning on studying a lot of math, you should learn the universal property of product groups. So uh, that's summarized by this diagram here. Really encourage you to take a look at this because the more math you study, the more these diagrams just come up. All right, a few other topics. Um, so by the end of your course, you will probably learn something about cyclic groups and abelian groups. Make sure you know what those things are. You'll also probably learn about the order of a group as well as the order of an element in a group. So here is a very short pop quiz about these things. So, uh, true or false? Every cyclic group is abelian. True or false? Every abelian group is cyclic. 
So here's a hint. One of these is true, the other one is false. And then here's a fill in the blank question about orders. Suppose g is a group and little g is an element of the group. The order of the element is what compared to the order of the group? So one of these inequalities or maybe the equality is going to be the right thing to fill in this blank. So I should mention a few famous theorems about finite groups that a new student will want to spend at least a little bit of time studying. The main theorems about finite groups are going to be these three. Actually, the third one's a collection of theorems. But So first is Lagrange's theorem. And I want to say something about these again. So pull the dot cam up. Uh, so Lagrange says if H is a subgroup of a finite group G, then the order of H divides the order of G. Cauchy's theorem says something that kind of looks like the contrapositive of that, or is it the converse of that? Yeah, the converse. Cauchy says <clears throat> if G is a finite group and P is a prime that divides the order of G, then there is a subgroup of order P. So just to make it hopefully a little bit more crystal clear why these things are sort of partially converses of each other, uh, this is saying if you have a subgroup of a finite group, the order of the subgroup has to divide the order of the group. Now this is saying, well, what if I have a divisor of the order of a finite group? Am I guaranteed that there's a subgroup of order that divisor? The answer is no. You need one extra thing. You need the divisor to be a prime. And then the Silo theorems, uh, those are about subgroups of order p squared, or p is a prime, or p cubed, or any power of p. So those get a little bit more complicated. Um, those aren't always covered in detail in a first course, but sometimes they are. So there's the Wikipedia link. Feel free to take a look. All right. Uh, you could easily spend a full semester just studying groups and nothing else, but I wanted to say a few things about uh, other topics. So. All right, the next topic I want to cover is a little bit of ring theory. So once again, new theory, new definitions. Uh, you'll want to know the definition for a ring, a subring, an ideal, a quotient ring, a ring homomorphism, and a ring isomorphism. If you don't know what the definitions are, these links will take you to them. And there are isomorphism theorems for rings that are very similar to the isomorphism theorems for groups. So Wikipedia has this sort of crazy looking page to organize all of the isomorphism theorems. So for groups, they've got this table and the statement of the isomorphism theorems, they call them A, B, and C, and D. For rings, there's an A, B, C, and D. It's 
a really good idea to compare the eighth theorem for groups to the eighth theorem for rings and so on. Uh, you'll s hopefully start to see what the analogy is. And then if you keep studying more math, there are isomorphism theorems for modules as well. But I think those usually stay out of a first abstract algebra course. You won't learn about that until a little bit later. All right, uh, there are a few special kinds of rings that come up in an introductory course. So by the end of your course, you should be able to define the following special kinds of rings. So what is a commutative ring? What is an integral domain? What's a Euclidean domain? What's a field? And you should also be able to say how these concepts are related. Uh, so for example, every field is an integral domain. There's other uh, implications to learn. Wikipedia has a pretty good explanation of this here. This is on the page for rings under the subsection special kinds of rings. So this chain is a chain of special kinds of rings, and uh, the ones further down the list uh, imply the ones further up the list. So I mean, every field is a Euclidean domain, every Euclidean domain is a PID, every PID is a UFD, every UFD is a GCD, and every this is a that, every this is a that, and that, and they're all rings. So click around here. Uh, chances are, if you are new to the subject, you'll find something interesting. And let me get back to the notes. Okay. One issue that comes up when studying rings for the first time is that there's a difference between prime elements and irreducible elements. And I'm mentioning this because I remember feeling surprised when I learned that these things are not necessarily the same. So I put links for primes and irreducibles right here. Let's just compare them real quick. Uh, so an element P of a commutative ring R is prime if it's not zero or a unit, and whenever P divides a product, A times B, then P divides A or P divides B. So being prime says something about the way you divide other products. On the other hand, check out the irreducibles. Uh, so right along the top, a non-zero, non-unit element in an integral domain is irreducible if it is, if it is not a product of two non-units. So being irreducible is saying something about the way other things divide you. So uh, the point I'm trying to make here is being prime, that has something to do with the way you divide other things. But being irreducible, that has something to do with the way other things divide you. And for the ring of integers, all the primes and irreducibles are the same, uh, but for other fancier rings, they're not. So here's a true-false quiz for you. Uh, true-false, number one, in every integral domain, every prime element is irreducible. And number two, in every integral domain, every irreducible is prime. Here's the hints. One of these is true, one of these is false. So have a think. All right, uh, the last thing I want to say is something about polynomial rings. So in an abstract algebra course, you might see the definition of a polynomial ring. And this is another area where you already have a lot of experience. Uh, so, like, you probably already know how to add polynomials and multiply them together. And I'm guessing you can also do polynomial long division. Uh, so, because you already have all this experience, it might be kind of hard to see, well, what else am I supposed to learn about these things? So, here is an example of a theorem 
That's only going to show up in abstract algebra. The theorem says any polynomial ring over a field is Euclidean. So even just to understand the vocabulary there is going to take a little bit of work. Um, but to understand the proof of this theorem, I, I think is a really great goal for a newcomer to abstract algebra. So you can read more about that here. There's a proof written out to that. Take a look if you'd like. Okay, uh, anything else you need to know from me? I want to remind you that I'm tutoring. Uh, if you're looking for an abstract algebra tutor, all my services are online these days. Um, for some students, we've been meeting over a call and just doing like a live session uh, with audio and video. Uh, for other students, they prefer to uh, like email me their homework a few days before it's due and I can add comments and notes to their work and send it back so they've got a chance to do some revisions. Um, so if either of those things sound helpful to you, please get in touch with me. Registration forms here on my website or just email me at jake at herndonmathservices.com. And that's enough abstract algebra for now, but I hope to be back with more soon. Bye.